Hey there, photographers. My name is Brenda Petrella, and welcome to the Outdoor Photography School YouTube channel, where we help you create better images and reconnect with nature. If this is your first time here, well, welcome, and thank you for joining us. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please consider hitting that subscribe button if you find any of our videos to be helpful. As many of you know, I took about a year off from YouTube for personal reasons, and I wasn't really able to respond to questions and comments during that time, but that's what I'm going to do today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the Outdoor Photography School newsletter, consider popping over to the website after this video to do that. Uh, I send about weekly or so emails on the latest articles and videos that we have coming out. The other thing you could do is just download the Hyperfocal Distance Made Easy ebook that's linked here in the channel banner and you'll be able to sign up that way as well. Okay and without further ado let's dive into your questions and get started. Now there were a lot of questions and so I've only handpicked out those that I thought would be the most relevant to most people and to save you some time I'm including some timestamps in the description below. I've organized my responses according to video so you can just jump ahead and see which ones you might be most interested in and lastly a lot of you had questions about equipment and if I talk about any equipment in my responses I will link those in the description below as well all right let's do it Gordon Robinson asks what time of year is the Milky Way season in Australia so in the Southern Hemisphere, the Milky Way season is from November to March, and in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way season is from March to November. The season is considered the time when the Milky Way is visible in the sky and the galactic center is also above the horizon. Ken Peterson asks, have you ever taken Milky Way shots either before or after the new moon date? By a day or two, I'm looking to avoid some crowds. So yeah, you can definitely photograph the Milky Way before and after the new moon because just a sliver of a moon really isn't going to have that much of a like washing out effect on the Milky Way. So you should be all set there. And another option is to figure out when the moon will be setting and then plan your shoot after that. So for instance, it could be a full moon, but if the moon is setting at 1 a.m. and the Milky Way Galactic Center is going to be in the sky by say 3 a.m., you can still photograph that without a moon in the sky. Nicholas B75 asks, what lens did you use for the picture you have in the background in the tutorial? You make reference to the Nikon 24 f1.8. Did you use this or the Rokinon 14mm f2.8? And AL had a similar question. Could you talk about the Milky Way pic on your wall and where and how was it taken? Can you see it anywhere or can PhotoPills track it as well? So yes, I used the Rokinon 14mm for that image. And it's actually a stitched panorama of several images, and that's how I was able to get that arch. And um, yes, that arch can be visible uh, at certain times of the year, and PhotoPills can help you plan that shot. Okay, Johnny Sargono, and I apologize if I'm saying anyone's names incorrectly. I'm doing my best. <laughs> uh, Johnny asks, is there any need to cover the eyepiece on the back of the camera so that light coming toward the rear of the camera doesn't somehow make it into a photo during a long exposure. So yes, uh, you can definitely switch that little piece uh, on your eyepiece to put the cover down and that will help with blocking some light that could potentially leak into the camera during a long exposure shot, although it, it's pretty unlikely that it will. So I wouldn't say that it's a necessary step, but more that it's a best practice. Steve Woodall asks, I have searched for the red transparency film, but can't find any with adhesive backing. Can you share where you buy it? Sure, I just get it off of Amazon and I will put a link in the description below so that you can find it more easily. I also have that and a whole bunch of other accessories and supplies and equipment that I use over on my kit.co account if you want to pop over there and see more. Edward Haynes asks, how can we help you make a living doing this? That is a really nice question and I really appreciate that, Edward. Um, so the best way really at this point is to support this channel, so subscribe, like the videos and share them with more people. We want to make sure that the word gets out about Outdoor Photography School so that the more people we reach, the more people hopefully will be learning about how to spend more time in the outdoors with their cameras. The other thing you could do is spread the word about OutdoorPhotographySchool.com, which is sort of the home website for all of the work that I'm doing on this channel. So thank you again for asking and thank you for everyone who has been supporting the channel so far. Sean Christopher asks, do you find that the Nikon 24mm f1.8 works better 
than the Rokinon 14 millimeter f2.8. So short answer is yes, I do think it's a little bit of a better lens. Unless you're comparing side-by-side -side photos, it's hard to tell. But the chromatic aberration is a little bit lower in the Nikon than in the Rokinon. And um, because it's at f1.8 versus 2.8, I can use shorter shutter speeds and a little bit of a lower ISO setting for night sky images. And that just makes things a little bit cleaner and a little bit less noise. Okay, Modern Explosive asks, uh, were the images edited or straight from the camera? So yes, all of my images are edited because I shoot in raw format and I use Lightroom for most of my editing, sometimes Photoshop. And for the time-lapse, I used LR time-lapse. Okay, so Creo3 asks, my question is for a Nikon D7000 with a Sigma 17 to 50 f2.8 lens, do I use the 500 rule? So the 500 rule is a basic starting place for estimating what your shutter speed should be for night photography. And basically you take 500 and you divide it by the focal length of your lens. So the D7000 is a crop sensor camera. And so crop sensor cameras don't follow the 500 rule, they follow the 330 rule. Uh, so you take 330 and you divide that by the focal length of the lens. Crazy Dude asks, do you use a light pollution filter at all? I have not used a light pollution filter, but uh, when I've read about other people who have used them, they find it to be very helpful for cutting down on that sort of yellow glow that can happen at the horizon. Dave Dyke asks, one thing I'm kind of unclear on is you make mention of use of an ISO of 1600. How did you arrive at this? Would it be a good place to start with crop sensor cameras as well? So yeah, sure. It, it doesn't matter if it's a crop sensor or micro four thirds or a full frame camera. An ISO of 1600 is a good starting place for most cameras. And I only recommend that was because I want you to play around with the ISO settings on your particular camera to see what would work best for you. And 1600 is basically it's, it's high enough that you should be able to expose for the stars well enough, but it's not so high that you're going to get a ton of noise. And so I would start at 1600 and then increase ISO from there and play around with your settings to see what would work best for your camera. Now these recommendations are uh, for when you're just having a camera on a tripod and not using a star tracker. If you were to use a star tracker, you can actually use much longer shutter speeds and decrease your ISO and that's why when you use a star tracker you tend to get cleaner images. Peter Ballin asks, uh, speaking of safety, I understand not to go out alone in certain areas. Do you bring bear spray or a firearm? Certain areas of Washington State and Alaska uh, require one of these. Um, so typically I don't need that level of protection in the areas that I photograph. Um, that said, when I have done photography up in the Yukon Territory of Canada in the summer, I have been required to carry bear spray and actually even go with a guide. Uh, so it's, it's a good idea to research the locations that you're going to to make sure that you're going to be properly prepared in, in terms of safety while you're there. Casey Threadgill asks, do you recommend the use of mirror lockup for astro shots? Does it make a difference? So yes, uh, locking up your mirror will help reduce any sort of vibration in your camera from that mirror flapping up and down. This is obviously specific to DSLR cameras and not mirrorless cameras. That's one advantage of mirrorless. Um, and so it's a, it's a good idea just to test it and look at your shots, you know, zoom right way in and see if it makes a difference if you're seeing vibration or not. Uh, from that mirror flapping up and down. Now, I shoot with the Nikon system, and I don't know about with other camera manufacturers, but one thing to keep in mind is when you're using mirror lockup, you have to press the shutter to have that mirror lock up, and then you have to press the shutter again for it to actually take the photo. So it's just something to consider. Christopher Hill asks, you said you shoot in RAW. Is that for individual shots, or do you do it with time-lapse as well? Being down here in Australia, I'm assuming the Milky Way moves the other way. I'm not sure if everything is the opposite. So yes, as I mentioned already, all of my images are shot in RAW, and I do that even for time-lapse, and I edit them in Lightroom and in LR time-lapse. And yes, in the Southern Hemisphere, the galaxy is moving the same way across the sky, just like the sun and the moon rise in the east and set in the west. This, the same is true for the galaxy. It has, makes no difference of what hemisphere you're in because it has to do with how the earth is rotating on its axis and we're all rotating in the same direction. So let's talk about the hyperfocal distance video a little bit. Many of you reached out and asked 
um, okay, you understand how to find the hyperfocal distance, but how do you then know how to measure it from your camera to whatever the hyperfocal distance is? Like, is that just an estimation or do you actually measure it or how does that work? So basically I use the PhotoPills app for that. They have an augmented reality feature in the app that's really cool where once you find your hyperfocal distance on their hyperfocal table, you just click on the AR button and that will bring up the augmented reality and it will basically show you where the hyperfocal distance is. So you'll see this little yellow circle with feet if you put that where your tripod is and then look out and follow that yellow line, you'll then see a blue sort of arced line and that's the, where the hyperfocal distance is. If you don't have the app, practice just measuring the distance and and just get a feel for it. I think over time, the more you estimate what's four feet look like, what is 12 feet look like, you'll, you'll get a good approximation of what that hyperfocal distance is and you won't have to measure it every single time. Chinito asks, what if you don't have a foreground? Where would you focus uh, to shoot the mountain? And Tim King has a similar question. If there isn't anything that close to focus on, what do, you, where do you, what do you do then? Well, then you just focus on whatever your subject is. So if your subject is the mountain, just focus on the mountain. This is if you're if you have nothing in your foreground or midground that you want to focus on, and you just have a big beautiful scene in the background, just just put your focus point on that big beautiful scene. Terry Dunlap asks. Brenda, what is that orange metal device attached to the base inside of your camera? It looks like it might be a device to quickly change from landscape to portrait orientation. And 30th in Crenshaw, Crenshaw asks, what kind of tripod and bracket do you have in this video? So yes, um, I use this L bracket. It is a universal L bracket from Three-Legged Thing. And it is that is the purpose, is to be able to mount your camera quickly and easily on your tripod in either landscape mode or in portrait mode without having to turn your ball head over 90 degrees, which can make your tripod really unstable. And the tripod that I was using in that video is uh, this one from Gitzo. It's a carbon fiber tripod. It's a GT1542T. It's a travel tripod and it's very light and I like it a lot. Who is Sandy Tan asks, does this technique, the hyperfocal distance, will also apply with mirrorless cameras? So yeah, of course it does. It has nothing to do with the camera body itself. It has more to do with the focal length of the lens and the aperture that you're using. The circle of confusion is another part that does have to do with the camera itself, but that is usually already calculated in the hyperfocal tables where you're trying to find that information. So Copycat NJ asks, what value should be used for a crop sensor? And I think what she's referring to here is, you know, crop sensor cameras usually have a crop factor of 1.5 or 1.6, and you will find your effective focal length by multiplying the focal length of your lens by that crop factor. That gives you the effective focal length. And so what value should you be plugging into uh, when you're looking at a hyperfocal table? So the short answer is when you're using photopills, you input what camera you're using into the hyperfocal table, and then it automatically is taking the crop factor into consideration. If you're not using an app or a calculator like photopills that does that, and you're instead using, say, just a table that you found online, most likely it is designed for full frame cameras. And in that case, then yes, you would multiply your focal length by the crop factor and use that effective focal length in the table. So many of you asked why I don't use auto blend layers in Photoshop to do my focus stacking. And it's not that I never do auto blend layers. It's just that I have found that artifacts can be formed by using that method. And that's important for if you're going to print your images. So it's less noticeable if you're just going to view your images online. But if you are going to print and you want to do some more fine tuning, then the method I showed in the video, which is a more manual method for doing focus stacking, is the way I would recommend doing it. Dennis Wood asks, when you change your focus point to the different distances, do you actually move the angle of the camera on the tripod or do you just change the focus point and not actually move the camera? So I only move the focus point, not the camera. The camera doesn't move. Pablo Doncor asks, I was wondering if it's possible to do the focus stacking technique using manual focus instead of autofocus. Is it recommended or not? So manual focus will work just fine as autofocus. It's really up to you and what your preference is. So the, it's not important about which focus mode you use, manual or autofocus, but it's more important about where you're focusing in the scene and making sure that you're focusing at multiple different points in the scene. 
Jagdish Chukani asks, is there a technique that you use before or during shooting to identify which shots you're taking for future stacking or for future uh, exposure bracketing? So yeah, one simple method is to like take a picture of your hand in front of your lens before and then after the series of photos that you've taken for your photo stack as a trigger for you to see as you're importing those photos into your photo editing software that everything in between these two oddball images are the ones that I want to use together in a blend. The airplane driver asks, do you know if stacking with variable focus points enhances the effect of an ND filter in a similar fashion? So would it turn a three stop ND into a four or six stop ND filter? So no, uh, the method that I taught in the video where we used layers and layer masks to do the focus stacking, that is not an additive effect of all of those layers. Those layer masks actually only uh, reveal or conceal the layer that's directly below the layer with the mask. And so you're basically slicing up the images and only taking the parts that you want for the final image. If you wanna learn more about layer masks, I just recently did a tutorial that goes down to the very, very basics of how to use layers and layer masks. And that would be a good foundation for the focus stacking tutorial if it didn't really make sense to you. Terry Newman asks, would it be fair to say, similar to HDR, that this technique of focus stacking isn't suited to landscapes with movement other than water, such as windy conditions and moving tree branches and leaves. So yes, when your subject is moving or any part of your image has movement in it, say from a windy day, then focus stacking those images will be a challenge. So what I would recommend doing is to take one additional image that is using the same exposure but with a shorter shutter speed so that you freeze the motion of those branches and leaves and then use that with a layer mask to paint into the rest of your stacked image. So many of you noticed in my travel tips for photographers video that I failed to mention what to do with your tripod when traveling. So my apologies, I did not mean to overlook that main item, but yes, I do travel with my tripod. Um, I use this one, the one I've already talked about many times. This is the Gitzo 15 42T and what I do is I most often check this in my checked bag. One thing that I'll do is either remove the ball head and stick it in a shoe or just put a big boot or something over the top of my tripod to better protect the ball head. And then I'll wrap the rest of the tripod up in jackets and other clothing just to keep it protected while it's in my duffel bag. And then I'll check that bag. Nicholas LeClerc asks, when you say you don't check your gear, you mean you bring everything into the cabin or the opposite? So yes, when I don't check my camera equipment, that means I'm bringing all of it into the cabin with me in a carry-on bag. And most often I will be also checking my tripod. Dave Nelson asks, what is your field tripod? So um, right now I'm using the Gitzo GT2531. This is my go-to tripod for when I need something super sturdy. It's heavier than my travel tripod and not that compact as you can see, but I find it to be super sturdy for windy conditions or say if I'm in a fast flowing stream or something like that and I need more stability than with my travel tripod. But I almost always otherwise use the travel tripod just because it's it's so much lighter and easier to carry around. Benjamin Saravia asks, I'm curious how much weight is in all that gear? What would be an optimal weight in your opinion? So the weight of the gear that I was talking about in that video, which was for basically a day pack and for day hiking with your camera, is about 20 pounds and that doesn't include water. And for me personally, with the type of photography that I do and my current fitness level, <laughs> um, that is probably my max for comfort. And what would be optimal for you? I would just say whatever is most comfortable for you. Sandra Kushel asks, uh, how do you choose the size between small, medium, or medium and large when you're picking out a backpack? So uh, the size of the backpack has to do with the length of your torso and most uh, bag manufacturers will provide guidance on how to measure your torso length in order to choose the right size backpack for you. Catherine McConnell asks, when you want to get at your camera, isn't it a pain to access using this setup? So yeah, in the video I show how to use a camera insert in a regular hiking backpack and um, that's me prioritizing comfort over convenience. And so when I'm doing a long day of hiking and I'm spending more time hiking than picking my camera in and out of the bag, then I'll go with that setup just because it is way more comfortable for my body to use for hiking. That said, yeah, it can be kind of cumbersome to be taking your camera out of the top of the bag. 
Jerry Sutherland asks, will the alcohol wipes have any detrimental effect on lens coating, such as the Nikon's nano coating? Um, so the alcohol wipes that I recommend are the Zeiss alcohol wipes, and they're specifically designed for camera lenses and other high quality optical equipment. So it should be totally fine. Gotham Photographia asks, um, have you ever considered placing a hand warmer over the battery compartment under the rain cover of the camera setup? So yeah, definitely, uh, especially when you're photographing in cold weather, it's really important to keep your batteries warm, otherwise they're gonna drain really fast. So what I described was putting the hand warmer over the lens and that was to prevent dew formation. But you can certainly also put a hand warmer uh, over the battery compartment in order to keep your batteries warm. So John Kidd asks, did you ever make a video on topic at five minutes, 40 seconds? And he's referring to my mention of a time-lapse video at night using hand warmers and whatnot in my setup for protecting my camera at night. And uh, so yeah, I did. It's uh, part three of my Milky Way series and I go into all of the details about how I set my camera up for night sky photography as well as the settings I use for time-lapse. Woo! We did it! We made it to the end. I hope you found these tips to be helpful. If you stuck out here with me, thank you for sticking around. And uh, get outside with your camera some. I know it might be hard to find time to do that, but try to do it. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.